talking to growers, um, you know, we are providing results, but we just don't get to see a lot of patients. So it's, it's a lot of fun because this is really, the, the, the reason we do this is because of patients. And um, it, it's, so it's just, it's just great to be here today. Uh, so this is a little bit of background about me. Uh, I uh, used to work for the FDA. And while I was there, I got really interested in cannabis. Uh, and the reason was uh, I worked for a program called MedWatch. And the MedWatch program uh, tracked adverse events uh, for prescription medications. And medications that were new to the market, uh, we would pay particular attention to um, just to make sure that there were no drug interactions or adverse events that were popping up and people could call and report those. And part of my job was to research other medications that people were taking uh, to see if there, if there were any known interactions. And we would also research medications that you know, might not be legal uh, you know, on the federal level. So I had to do a lot of research on cannabis and um, I was really just amazed that there wasn't a lot of drug interactions, there, there really wasn't um, a lot of side effects in general. Uh, so uh, through, you know, after going through paper after paper and, and trying to figure out uh, you know why Nancy Reagan had always told me that it was so terrible um, I began to change my mind uh, and and I was able to kind of you know keep that as a, as a really a hobby for a long time just just you know looking at cannabis research uh, and just uh, keeping up with the the current state of everything uh, moved to Arkansas about seven years ago and my wife's from here, and that's kind of how I got here. Uh, grew up in Tennessee, uh, and, and it was, it, you know, the amendment was, the program was, was in the works. It was kind of, was, it was happening. There was going to be a vote. I knew I wanted to get involved. I was really interested in the patient safety aspect, the testing, and so, um, you know, came up with a plan, and um, about 2017, we, we really, me, me and a, another partner, uh, went ahead and, and secured a location, started working on the project. We partnered with Steep Hill Labs, which uh, Steep Hill is a California-based company. Um, it's a network of, of 10 labs across the country in Mexico. Um, it was great for us because, you know, that they had all the expertise. Uh, cannabis is, is difficult to test because they're not established methods, uh, because it's not federally legal. Uh, you know, if we were testing spinach, then um, there, there are lots of, of methods, and by methods I just mean uh, just a way to set up an instrument, um, you know, establish ways to get a result. Uh, so, so you really, you know, need somebody that knows how to do it. Uh, so we, we partnered with Steve Hill. It took us about a year to get everything built out, get instruments, uh, you know, get accredited. Uh, we were ISO accredited, uh, which was probably the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. Uh, and and here we are, you know, we took our first samples in in 2019, it was April, uh, and you know, we've, we've been growing just with the industry uh, ever since, uh, and, and it, it's been great. So today we're going we're gonna to cover a few things and then have some time for questions. Uh, we're going to talk about just cannabis testing in general, how that works, uh, you know, we, it, it, it's not, we're not growing anything. We're not selling anything. It's not as sexy as, as some of these other jobs out there. Um, you know, we're just a bunch of nerds. We really like it though, and like to talk about. It. Um, we're going to talk about the actual data for Arkansas. You know, what does uh, what does the flower data look like here? What does the terpene data look like here? Um, you know, what what does our product mix look like uh, in the natural state? Uh, we're going to look at a, a laboratory COA and just talk about how to read it. Uh, the, the COAs are, are pretty complicated because, you know, ISO requires us to put a lot of things on there that are probably confusing uh, to, to someone who's not a chemist. Uh, so we're going to talk about that, what's important on there, what's not important, and, and what to look for. And then we're also going to talk about the uh, pharmacist consulting program, uh, which, which is a program that is... is I think unique to Arkansas and it's something that I think um, people can take advantage of and, and as a pharmacist uh, I'm really really passionate about that as well all right so let's talk about the testing requirements but first I just want to give you an overview of the process how, to, how it works how samples are tested how those those results get on uh, 
packages that, that you guys may purchase. Uh, so the first thing that happens is a grower will reach out to us and say, hey, we, we've got a sample, uh, we've got a batch that is ready for testing. Uh, we send field samplers out to facilities. Uh, they, they are taking those samples, putting those in a sterile bag. Uh, the, the grower will provide us with a manifest and the manifest allows us to transport that legally within the state. Um, and we, we bring that back to the lab. So when we're doing sampling, we, we have SOPs for that. Those SOPs are also accredited. And what that means is we're taking a, a, a sample that is representative of an entire batch. You know, if it's flour, uh, a batch size in Arkansas is 10 pounds. So we will take a, a sample of that and Arkansas requires us to get 0.5% of that. So if it's a 10 pound batch, and that is 22.65 grams that we will take and sample and bring back to the lab for testing. So once we get it back, uh, you know, Arkansas has a seed to sale system called uh, R Stems. Uh, BioTrack runs that, and BioTrack uh, tracks everything in the state uh, when it comes to marijuana. So when we get back with that manifest, we check that in, we accept it, and we tell BioTrack that we got this thing. Uh, at that point, we, we check it into our lab. Uh, everything that we get is barcoded, and we can track it internally uh, with these barcodes. Uh, we homogenize the sample, and we'll split that up among the individual tests that we'll kind of get into uh, in a minute. And then we, we put those tests, once it's been prepped, onto an instrument. Uh, those instruments then give us results. Our chemists look at the data, and then once uh, they, they feel good about the data, they will publish that data. Our lead scientists will then approve the data. And then once it's all approved, it gets uh, consolidated into a certificate of analysis, which I, I abbreviate as a COA. Um, if I use any abbreviations today, please stop me. I, I'm, I'm really bad about that. Um, and then once that's done, the last step is to put that information into BioTrack, which clears that, that batch from the sample comes from to be sold to a patient. Uh, and, and you know anything that you get at a dispensary has passed all the tests. Uh, I know that, um, you know, Kathy earlier had, had some great things to say about uh, just the, the potency terpene results and, and what that looks like and what, you, what you're gonna look for. You, what you don't see on the label is probably, you know, did it pass pesticides or heavy metals? Um, but you know that it did if you're, if you're getting it at a dispensary, it's a safe product, it's something that has been tested. Uh, and BioTrack's really the gatekeeper there. Unless that information is in there, then um, it, it can't be even manifested or transferred uh, to a dispensary. Okay, so let's talk about the tests that are actually required here in Arkansas. Uh, we test for potency. As, uh, as, as you guys know, and, and a lot of people, that's the first thing they think about. Uh, when when we're talking about uh, cannabis testing. And, and it's, you know, it, it makes a lot of sense because that's how you're getting your dosage. In Arkansas, what's required are THC, THCA, CBD, and CBDA. Uh, we, we do test for more cannabinoids than that. Uh, you know, earlier we were talking about CBG, and CBN, and THCB. Uh, we also test for those, but, but these are what's required. And this is what probably comes on your BioTrack generated label from a dispensary. Uh, because that's what's on there. That, that is, that's, that's what is required and what, what BioTrack will bring, if that makes sense. Uh, we test for heavy metals, pesticides, micro, water activity, moisture, moisture content, and then uh, terpenes are optional. Um, we, you know, we, we're doing more and more terpene tests. There's more and more of that data that's, that's out there. Uh, you know, a, a lot of our customers have realized that people want to know uh, what, what terpenes are in their products. And so uh, even though it's not a required test, uh, people are doing it. And we're, we're going to get into these a little more detail in just a minute. And before I move on, I mean, you, you can... Uh, uh, earlier in the in Kathy's talk, she, she kind of had two plants that were similar and said, you know, what can you tell me about these? Um, I'll always do this uh, just with this picture here. I've got a laser pointer, which, well, it won't show up on the screen. Um, but by looking at that, I mean, can you tell if it's safe? And um, 
I don't think you can. I mean, you, you maybe it, it looks pretty good. It, it looks, you know, there's there's trichomes on there. Um, it looks about uh, maybe 11, 12 percent moisture. Um, you know, however, you, you can't really tell what's in that without some sort of analytical testing. Um, you know, what, how much THC does this have in there? What, what's the terpene profile? Um, you know, microbiology, is there anything growing on that that, that you wouldn't want to, wouldn't want in your body? Uh, you know, does it have any, any pesticides? I mean, you, you, things that you can't see from the naked eye, you know, it's kind of a, of a trick question. Uh, so you really can't make any decisions, whether it's a clinical decision, whether about dosing or a safety decision, is this a safe product without a lab test? Um, I, I like to say that the you know, cannabis plant is, is very safe, um, extremely safe, but things on the plant can be dangerous and, and even deadly for some patients, and, and that's why we test. One more thing with that is, is um, I, I think you guys remember recently in the news there was uh, some some vape cards that were causing uh, people to die. Um, you know, 800 cases in, in, in 40 states in just a couple months. Uh, there were there were 15 deaths, and all that was from additives to vape cards. Uh, it was people that were uh, taking. You know, maybe oil that was good and they were combining that with vitamin E acetate which is terrible for your lungs vitamin E acetate happens to have about the same consistency as cannabis oil and so they could they could fool people and it was all black market products it was products that were, were coming from places that, that maybe either didn't have to test anything or either maybe didn't pass testing um, you know we we test some black market products sometimes and find all kind of stuff in there uh and, and i and i suspect that a lot of the things that you buy that you could buy outside of the dispensary in arkansas are products that couldn't pass testing in other states and they end up going out the back door and, and you know finding their way on a truck and they end up in arkansas and you know maybe you're saving a little money from a dispensary, but you know the product you're getting is inferior and it could completely hurt you. Um, I, I've never tested a black market product that had the potency claim that was on the label as being correct. It, it's it's always about at it, best seventy percent. All right, I'm going to move on. One more thing about this slide before I move on. Uh, these are the requirements for usable marijuana, and the way the state splits that up is, is anything that's flower or trim, they call usable marijuana, and really everything else is called a, a concentrator infused product. So, and I've got some examples there, um, you know, flower trim, that's pretty easy. Anything that's infused, just a few products I know we see here in Arkansas are gummies, chocolates, tinctures, trochies lozenges honeys there's hard candy um and then you know for concentrates you know we do have different types of extraction here we've got hydrocarbon we've got co2 extraction uh there, there's rosin presses out there um people are making bubble hash there's rso available different waxes butters um, lots of different types of vape cards and keef also belongs in this category where it, it's really kind of a tweener between usable marijuana or a concentrate, but we call it a concentrate here in Arkansas. The big difference is uh, residual solvents. And the residual solvents, and, and we'll talk in detail about what that is in just a minute, um, but uh, anything that is extracted using a solvent that is on the Arkansas list, um, you know, we've got 44 solvents on our list in Arkansas. It's, the, it's actually the most in the country. Uh, anything that is extracted using a solvent on the list must be tested for solvents. In reality, people in Arkansas uh, doing extractions are using five or six different types and, you know, not a lot of the sort of random ones on there, on our list. All right.
right? So again, these are the tests we're doing. Uh, the, the Arkansas Department of Health sets these rules. Um, you know, while the, the ABC, the uh, Alcoholic Beverage Commission, is that right? Uh, the ABC uh, is over the growers, is over cultivators, dispensaries, where the Department of Health in Arkansas oversees patient cards, caregiver cards, and also laboratory testing. Uh, so, so they set the rules, and, and by that, they, they, they set what we test for, and also the action limits, which makes something a pass or, or, or not a pass. Um, and and that's, that, is their, that is their role there. They approve labs, so they, they approved us. And, and that approval is dependent on ISO accreditation again. Um, and we've got to keep that current. And it covers everything from the testing process to you know sample prep, uh, sample pickup and even sample destruction. Okay, so let's talk quickly about potency testing. So potency testing, we consider to be cannabinoids and terpenes. Uh, we test cannabinoids by HPLC, and that's, that's liquid chromatography. Um, and, and the way we do that is, is, is we get pure standards of each cannabinoid. Uh, we run those pure standards on our instruments at about 20 different known concentrations. Uh, and, you know, we're doing this with, with balances uh, that have been calibrated and, and pipettes that have been calibrated. Uh, we run those in 20 different concentrations and that will give us a, a a straight line if everything looks good once we have that calibration curve established then when we run another sample we know exactly where that falls on that line and so we can tell you how many cannabinoids are on that and specifically how much THCA, THC, THCB uh, in each particular product that we test. Um, every time we run a sample with potency we also run a blank, which which uh, it's supposed to not have anything in it, uh, right? So if we run that blank and there's something in there, if we can see something on chromatography, it means that we have some sort of problem with our instrument. Uh, we also run a, a matrix blank, which is we will have flour with a known amount of cannabinoids in it, um, or we usually use, use hemp flour, uh, and we will run that and if we get the what, we're, what we expect then uh, the instrument's working properly. Um, we also use matrix spikes which is doing the same thing but then we'll add cannabinoids to it and so you expect to see what you're adding on your instrument. And then every 10 samples we run what's called a CCV which is a continuous calibration verification and that is a, a, a HPLC vial uh, that has every cannabinoid in it at a known concentration. And so when we, we check that, and if it looks good, if, if, if it falls within 5% of where we want it to hit, then everything below that to the next CCV is an acceptable result. Um, if we have a problem there, then, then we will run it. I feel like I'm kind of getting into the weeds, but I'll keep going, I'll keep going. Uh, there's a lot of different cannabinoids. There's, a, there's 120 known cannabinoids. Uh, we can test for about 20. We could, we could test for more. We kind of test for what the market asks us for. Uh, you know, some of the cannabinoids are so minor that you, you really would never see those unless you're getting some really um, exotic cultivars. Uh, you know, THC, THCA, CBD, CBDA are the, are the most dominant, and that's, that's what we see, you know, the most of. Um, in cannabis, and you know, one distinction is is when a plant is growing, um, it's it's growing acid form cannabinoids, so it's growing the the the, the A's, so THCA, CBDA, THCVA. Um, once it's harvested, and it's either consumed not by smoking. Uh, or it's, it goes through extraction, or when it's heated, then that decarboxylates, uh, you know, 
eat carbs, you lose that acid molecule and it becomes an active cannabinoid. And so that's why you can you can eat raw cannabis and you know you, you won't feel any effects. Uh, it's because it's not decarbed. Um, and so when you get that, when you're looking at a report and you see THCA, CBDA, then you know that that, that has not a decarb product and it's it's flour or it's something that's extracted without heat. So this is just a breakdown of, of the type of test that we're doing. Um, you can see 21% of, of all the tests we run are potency. And um, you know that makes sense because growers are extracting products that maybe they're gonna put into a, an edible. Maybe they're gonna make that into a tincture. Um, and so at that point, what they really need to know is what, what potency is that, you know, so we're doing potency only on something else. Um, They've already tested the flowers. They know it, it, it's it's good for pesticides. They know that it, it passes our other test. Uh, you know, metals, micro, and pesticides, you know, about the same. Uh, less moisture and water activity because we only do that on flour. And then solvents are only required for things that are extracted with solvents. So that's about five percent of the tests we do. And then terpenes is popping up at 6%. I think if we did this a year ago, that would probably be about 3%. And this is the matrix breakdown. So, you know, this is our data, it's not ABC data, but I bet it's pretty reflective of what's what's available on the market or probably what is, is sold. Um, it's a little bit different because the batch requirements for flour are different than for edibles, concentrates, carts, and tinctures. Um, the, the little pink slice that you can't really, it's not labeled or are topicals up there. Okay. This is the last 10 weeks of data for us. And this is just a histogram to show you total dry percent THC. Um, and it, it, it's sort of a, a nice um, bell curve. Uh, you know, we've got, we've got some strains over here in the eight or nine. A lot of those are probably one-to-one -one strains that also have some CBD in there. You know, we've got a few that are that are pushing the 30 limit, but you can see there's a big fall off about about 24, um, 25%. So what do you guys think the average, uh, in the last 10 weeks, what's the average total THC that uh, we've seen? Anybody, anybody? 21. It's very close, sir, very close. 21.7, 20.7. Uh, and that is, that's the last 10 weeks. And, you know, if you look over time, uh, that number is, is probably uh, come up. I think that people have just gotten better. Uh, you know, maybe the genetics have gotten more stable over time. Uh, when when growers in Arkansas, you know, had to figure out what works here. You know, our climate's different. Uh, some of the, the things that grow better in, in maybe Colorado or places where people train, this, this didn't do as, as well in Arkansas. Even though we've got indoor facilities, uh, you know, they're, they're, the, the cure times, uh, the, and, and I'm, I'm not an expert here, and I know there's some experts uh, in this room, but a point being is, is we, as an industry, we've gotten better over time as far as cannabinoid content. Um, so, you know, one question that I, that I get a lot is, is just, you know, what is total THC? Uh, you know, when, when, you, when you get your, your medicine and you've got a label on there that's probably from a cultivator, and then you've also got a label that's from a state on there that prints from Biotrack, and it, it might say THCA, uh, it might say THC, it might say total THC. You might get online and look on, on Weed Maps or Leafly and it'll, it'll say something, um, it'll say THC, uh, but then you get to a dispensary and maybe it's something different. Well, that's for a few reasons, but, but one of them is um, there is a conversion that takes into account the decarboxylation that I was talking about earlier. 
Um, and it's a way to give you, you know, total active THC in a product. And Arkansas and many other states require the total THC percent to be on the label. All right. And, and this is the equation. It's 0.877 times THCA plus total plus delta nine. When I when I say THC, I am referring to delta nine. Um, and the reason for this is is that is the amount that you're going to lose from decarboxylation. Uh, so the total THC is the actual best way to determine um, the amount of THC in product. Does that make sense? I, you guys probably didn't expect to have to look at math on a Saturday morning, but um, I, I get a lot of questions about that. So if you see a, a product uh, that just lists THCA, then that's not really the whole picture. Uh, you know, you, you can always take that and your, your total THC is going to be a little bit less. And this is a real world example. Um, THCA, if it's 25% and THC is 0.5, which is something we could see in a flower sample, um, then your actual total THC is going to be 22.4. Would that be considered high or low? If I'm looking for low THC or high THC, what number should I expect to see in terms of the total THC percentage? I'd say high is anything above the average. You know, anything above, you know, the, the, the 20, 21 percent, um, you know, and then the low is, is just going to be, on the other side of the spell curve, you know, I, however, um, you know, I, I think it's kind of a, and this is my, this is a, my opinion, uh, that really the sweet spot for cannabis flower is, 18 to 21 um, percent you know you can only grow uh, cannabis to contain so much there's a finite amount of cannabinoids and terpenes that will end up in a flower right um, so if you're pushing 30 percent cannabinoids then you don't have a lot of room for terpenes or minor cannabinoids or the, the other things that you want uh, in in a in a flower shape for me anyway. Um, so so personally, and I'm a patient. I sort of seek out strains uh, that are unique uh, as far as their terpene profiles and are in the 18, 19, 20 percent range. Maybe that was uh, too much information, but are you recording this? Absolutely, absolutely. His question was, you're looking for strains maybe with, with a lower THC that are going to have a better pro terpene profile just because there, there's more room uh, in that plant. You know, because, and I probably didn't do a great job explaining this, but, but in cannabis, all the cannabinoids start out as, as CBG. And then there's enzymes in each cannabis plant that changes that. CBG to other cannabinoids is based on its genetics, you know, and so if it's maxed out to find to, to, to just go to a Go to THCA then there, there's not going to be much else in it One quick story about this before I move on. Uh, had a cultivator in Arkansas that um, had gotten some genetics uh, from another group that they work with in another state, and you know they they grew it here, and it, everything looked good. Uh, the, the plants looked good, the flower looked good, but they just weren't getting the same amount of THC in that plant, and so they they were you know, concerned about it. Uh, they wanted to figure out why. And after going and meeting with them and kind of looking at lab reports, you know, we figured out that the other state was just using THCA for their 
calculations. So they weren't using total THC. And so that made about a, a 4% difference. Um, so total THC is important. All right, the other thing that, that is kind of interesting uh, with how we do it here, and, and, we, and I get a lot of questions about this, is you see where it says dry percent up there. Um, so what, what the heck does that mean? Um, so everything that we do in Arkansas is moisture corrected. Um, so we, we do a moisture content test on every flower sample. Um, it has to be below 15% to pass the state's requirements. And I, I would say our average moisture content is going to be 11%. You know, we see a lot in sort of the 9 to 12% range. Uh, and that moisture content is factored into the potency. And, you know, why that's important is, you know, number one, if it's above about 15%, it's just hard to smoke. It's too wet. Um, and the other reason it's important is, you know, if you've got, say that, that this nug here is 20%, but it's 14% moisture. And then you had another one that was identical that was 20%, but 8% moisture. Which one would be more potent? What do you guys think? It's the one, I, I, I've got that greater than sign, so I thought that uh, I kind of gave you guys the answer. Um, it, it's the one with more moisture, because when that dries out, then the cannabinoids will be concentrated. And so that 20% will end up being 22, 24% because the water leaves and what's left is more cannabinoids, okay? So what we do in Arkansas is we factor in the moisture to the potency to, to put everybody on a, on a level playing field. So someone couldn't you know, send us wetter products to get better potency results. All right, so here's a histogram for terpenes. Um, we see terpenes up to about 3%. Um, average here is 1.8. Uh, some of the outliers here on the end is, is probably trim, so it's, it's not gonna have much in it. And you know, terpenes are, are extremely volatile. You know, when, when you smell cannabis, you're smelling terpenes. Um, terpenes are, um, you're losing terpenes really quickly. You know, you harvest, terpenes are coming off. Uh, if you're, you're, you open your, your packaging when you come home, you know, you're losing terpenes. Uh, you know, some growers in Arkansas package in nitrogen, they package certain ways to try to retain terpenes. When you're looking at terpene test results, I would focus on the ratios, you know, because what you're getting is probably gonna be a little bit different. Um, a little bit of terpene goes a long way. So if you look at a report and it, it says it's, you know, 0.05% terpenes, then that doesn't mean there's there's not much in there. Uh, you know, it, it's still gonna be a, a product that you seek out, but, but look for those ratios. If you're looking for something with myrcene and linalool, and if you find it, you know, if it's, if it's two time, two parts myrcene, one linalool, uh, then, then that's what you want to focus on instead of sort of the maximum amount. Sir? Well, it, it, it wouldn't be gummies. Uh, you know, it, it would be oils, and it would be, you know, there's some products out there that are, you know, high terp, full spectrum products. Uh, there, there are terpene infused products out there. Once it's in an oil and it's sealed, then um, it, they're not going anywhere. So glass will contain terpenes, uh, you know, it, when it's exposed to air, uh, oxidates, uh, light is, is not good for terpenes, um, so. So in that case, uh, 
Well, I wouldn't re recommend staying away from flour. Um, I, you know, I, I think flour is great. It has a has a great part in our in our industry here. Um, it, it's. It, I think that my my point is to uh, just focus on ratios instead of a certain amount. If when you get flour, try to keep it sealed. Yeah, sir. Yeah, that's a great point. That's a great point. Is most extraction process strip terpenes? Uh, uh, there, there, and there are lots of types of extraction where you can capture those terpenes before the cannabinoid extraction and then add those back. Um, so, great point, sir. I don't know, um, and I've, I've seen recently some some cryo frozen material. Um, don't have any personal experience with that. Um, I, I think uh, it, you know, I, I don't know if the cold is going to preserve as much as uh, just keeping away from air. Although, Chris, do you have any insight there? No, just for for uh, like keeping flour in the fridge versus. That's uh, Chris from Agri Integrated Solutions, and he knows more about terpenes than I do. <laughs> Isn't there something you can purchase that you put with your product that can keep like the moisture, additional moisture, etc. out? Can you talk? Yeah, I know a lot of the products that are available um, contain little, you know, desiccant packs. There, there are uh, products out there that um, are, you know, probably available at dispensaries that will um, absorb moisture and uh, and keep that at a at a good moisture content. All right, I'm gonna keep going, y'all. And and so this is the last ten weeks in Arkansas. These are the terpenes we're seeing. Um, you know, myrcene, kaophylin, limonene, terpenaline, alpha humulin, a little bit of pinene. Um, it, it, we, we see a lot of myrcene because, uh, you know, myrcene strains tend to be higher in THC. Uh, and one concept is back when a lot of uh, cannabis genetics was happening and people were trying to maximize THC in, in cannabis, uh, you know, they, they, there were these cannabis cups and different events where people could go to and showcase their products. Um, and a lot of the myrcene strains just ended up being the most potent and most popular. And so other people would buy those seeds and grow those seeds. And so myrcene is very prevalent. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a great cannabinoid or great terpene. Uh, and, and we see a lot of that here. Uh, we actually have a have a pretty good mix here um, in, in Arkansas. Um, you know, and we talked about terpenes a little earlier, but you know they, they exist everywhere in nature. You know, they're not just unique to cannabis. Um, you know, many uses in the plant, uh, mainly for defense for for insects. Um, that's what you know naturally. That's why cannabis is developing these terpenes in nature. Okay, I think I'm gonna run out. Of, I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna go through this a little bit quicker. Uh, so, 
We test pesticides on two different instruments, uh, our LCMS, which is liquid chromatography, and also our GCMS, which is gas chromatography. Some of our uh, pesticides that we test in Arkansas are a little more volatile. Those do better on gas chromatography. Uh, we we're only doing about six over there. The rest are on uh, liquid chromatography. That is our Shimazu 8050 uh, triple quad, and that is our um, LCMS, so liquid. Um, as we were getting accredited, one morning I woke up and uh, went to the kitchen. My wife was um, upset and I was like, what? what is wrong? And she was like, who's Amanda? And I, I, I was completely clueless. Like, I, like, what are you talking about? She's like, I had a dream that you were having an affair with somebody named Amanda. And I said, you know, girl, the only person I'm... The only thing I'm spending a lot of time with is the LCMS, uh, so we've named this instrument Amanda. It's <laughs> Meet Amanda. Uh, this is just uh, our rack where the samples actually go. Uh, this is, uh, you know, auto sample vials. That's an oven on this side. Uh, that's a column. Just a little bit about how this thing, how it, how it looks, and a little bit about how it works. It's got high pressure pumps. Um, you know, we are passing these samples through a column which, which splits up analytes and then it goes and is, um, can be read on the actual mass spec and it gives us a chromatogram and we can see if uh, there's any kind of pesticides in that product. Same calibration is just like potency where we're running different uh, concentrations of the analytes of interest. So uh, heavy metals, we, we look for four in Arkansas, all the class one FDA uh, metals. Um, it is lead, arsenic, cadmium, and mercury. Um, you know, cannabis is an accumulator plant, uh, so it's gonna, it's gonna suck up any sort of metals from the environment. Everything we're testing for is at the parts per million. Uh, all the action limits are in parts per million, except for metals, which is parts per billion. So. We're looking at, um, you know, we're getting into the weeds with, with metals. Uh, and, you know, typical areas of concentration, uh, you know, soil is the biggest one. I mean, everybody here in Arkansas is bringing in soil, they're buying quality stuff. Um, sometimes we still see a few things in there. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's really hard, like metals is, is really hard. Heavy metals are, are really hard to pass just because, you know, they're, these, these elements are, are prevalent in the environment, they're everywhere, they're in this room right now. Not to scare anybody. Uh, and metals are analyzed by ICPMS. Uh, that's just a shot of the plasma. Uh, it's really hot uh, on the ICPMS. So solvents we talked about, you know, we do 44 in Arkansas. We do that on gas chromatography because, you know, solvents are volatile. Uh, that's our GCMS. Um, and, you know, people in Arkansas are, are using uh, you know, a lot of CO2 extraction, which is not, we don't have to test for CO2 because that's not a, an analyte and it's not a, um, a, a typical solvent. Um, you know, some hydrocarbons like, like butane, pentane, isobutane, uh, you know, alcohol, I, IPA or iso, isopropyl alcohol is on our list in Arkansas, which is kind of challenging because, you know, tinctures contain alcohol and we've got to taste tinctures, so um, that's challenging sometimes. Uh, sometimes our customers have to use maybe products that I don't want to say inferior, but they would they would rather use you know pharmaceutical grade stuff that contains alcohol, but sometimes they can't because it wouldn't pass solvent testing. Um, this is a rule that I'm trying to get changed right now with the Department of Health. Um, all right, and we kind of talked about uh, moisture content, water activity is sort of the other piece of that and you know water activity it, it's really a, it, it's judging something to see if it has the moisture available for bacteria to grow um, and so you know if something is below about 0.6 water activity then it's not going to grow anything harmful and um, the, the limit in Arkansas is 0.65 um, so all our flowers test for water activity um, and it, it's um, you know, we consider that a, a micro test. And we also do a microbiology panel on every, every sample. All right, so 
let's talk about a certificate of analysis real quick. Uh, just what all the the numbers mean and the acronyms, and uh, hopefully you guys will be armed to look at those and get the information you need um, for cannabinoids and terpenes. So this is a this is a certificate of analysis. You can see there's a lot of data on there, um, but really what's important is for Arkansas. You know we want to use our dry percent. Oh, oh, and so we can see THC. 0.25 THCA 23 and then you can see the dry percent over here on the totals at 20 percent we've got moisture results we've got water activity results you can see the green passes uh, you can also see individual each individual pesticide that we test for you can see the terpene results over uh, on the right hand side um, and then you know the metal I don't know if you guys can see this because it is pretty small on the screen is it that big but you can see the metals they're, they're like this sample has trace amounts of metals in it and that's completely normal um, you, you, you know you're gonna see that in every sample there's gonna be trace amount of metals if I test something and I don't see any metals in it then I start worrying about my instrument you know, it probably lead and cadmium. Um, we, we rarely see any kind of mercury. Uh, I do see, uh, you know, those two a, a little bit, but we rarely have anything that's, you know, that the action limits on these are, are between two and 500 or mercury is 100. You know, I see things a lot like in the, in the 20, 30 range. Yeah. Uh, sure. Yeah, I, I don't know how to get it to you guys, but um, you, you can email me or, you know, I've got my email on here, but I, I'd be happy to share my slides with you guys. Uh, and then about the uh, pharmacist consulting program. So, so I'm a pharmacist, I'm a pharmacist consultant for five dispensaries uh, in Arkansas. And it's a great resource. Uh, so if you have a question, you know, bud tenders are great. Um, However, you might have a question about a drug interaction. You might have a question, you know, about a medical condition or something that um, you, uh, you know, side effect that you're concerned about. And, and to be honest with you, um, you know, I didn't learn any of this stuff that we were talking about today in pharmacy school. Like we, like we just didn't talk about the endocannabinoid system. We didn't talk about cannabinoids. Um, you know, so so, you know, maybe a typical pharmacist wouldn't know this stuff. Uh, you know. Same with physicians. I, I think that this is, you know, a lot of this is self-taught. Um, I've taken courses, um, you know, point being, you know, use that resource. Uh, every, every dispensary has one, and um, the pharmacists that are going to be really happy to speak with you guys about those. Um, so it's 11. I, I've, I skipped over a couple of things I wanted to talk about, so I'm going to at least cover one of those right now. And one is... I get a lot of questions about uh, edibles and about uh, edibles packaging and about how th there's maybe a, a common thought out there that people aren't getting the amount of cannabinoids in an edibles pack that they, that they think they should. Um, so let's talk about that for a second. Uh, you know, what happens there is the state has a limit which is 10 milligrams per serving, right? Um, so because of that, if people formulate to 10 milligrams per serving, then they're gonna be over on probably half of those. And if they're over, then they have to destroy it. Um, like a batch of 10,000 gummies in the trash. And it's not even that easy because the ABC has to come and watch, um, you know, so, That's not a good option. So people formulate uh, to around 9.5, you know. But when you formulate to 9.5, you're gonna hit between nine and 10, you know, and sometimes a little lower. And making those kind of products is, is, is really difficult uh, because you're taking a result from an oil um, and you're calculating based on that result, you know, hey, what's, what do I, how much oil do I need to put in this product to get 10,000 gummies 
and you're putting that into a big vat and then you are mixing that and it's heated and I don't know the exact process but the amount of oil that you use for the gummies because we're just talking about 10 milligrams per serving is, is just a little so if you lose any on any kind of implement if your balance is, is a little bit off and every balance in the in the world you can, it can be completely calibrated but static messes with balances a lot of things can mess with balances um, it, it's really difficult to do uh, so you know, that, that's one factor. The other factor is the packaging is not easy to get right now. So they're having to order packaging from somewhere probably overseas. It's taking time to get here. Um, so, so even though the packaging might say 100 milligrams and you might get a product that is 90 milligrams, um, it's not because there's a nefarious plan to just give people less cannabinoids. It's just that it's hard. and the way that our rules are set up here um, most states have a variance where, where they'll say you can call anything that is between 9 and 11 you can call that 10 grams and so it, it gives people the freedom to really hit that 10 gram mark or shoot for there because they've got these this range but here you know we can't do that so what ends up happening is um, people think that people maybe are being untruthful or that they're trying to give them less you know when reality is just the nature of our system here does that make sense okay i'm going to stop a few minutes you may have a question dr nichols well brandon i'm glad that the cultivators are producing a lot more detailed cannabinoid and terpene profiles the rub is getting that information to the patients and their doctors and we talked about this yeah is, is there any interest in the industry uh in trying to form a way so this information is readily available for all of us that's a good point so dr nichols uh was just talking about how um you know we, we're doing testing we have coas sometimes that information isn't it's hard it's not disseminated to everybody and you know, the first thing with that is, I, I, I don't, I think that anybody that wants that information, um, I, I don't think anybody would, would want to prevent anybody else from getting that information. In fact, you know, if you go back there, there are displays with terpenes out, and I think people want to advertise their products. But a couple things in Arkansas is, number one, there are really strict advertising rules for cultivators. Um, they, they are... They can't even really have websites. Uh, they, they can't really, they are very restricted on how they can advertise. Um, and that's something we're trying to change in the legislature. So I think that's a big problem right there because they couldn't really release a lot of that information because it would be seen as advertising and they would be fined. And so the other part of that is you can get it at a dispensary and everything that's shipped to a dispensary is gonna have a COA attached to it. Uh, and you know, they're gonna have that information. I don't know how easy it is for them to get that. Um, to Dr. Nichols' point, I mean, I, I would love to see sort of a database to where it, people can find that information, you know, quickly and, and easily. I, I don't know how we could accomplish that, um, but I'm, I'm happy to, to work with you on that. Uh, you know, it, it, with, with what we do, everything is, you know, part of our ISO requirements is confidentiality. So we have to be really careful with how we share data. And in fact, we, we can't share data unless we get permission. Um, but then again, I don't think anybody's trying to hold back information. I think, you know, it would be better. Um, I, I think they, cultivators would rather ha have the freedom to tell people and advertise, but they're sort of handcuffed by the way the regulations are set up. Sir? Besides dispensaries, where does the COA go? Well, the COA goes to the state. I mean, the, the state gets kind of a, a limited COA because what they want to know is what is in BioTrack, you know? And so the information in BioTrack, some of it's pass-fail, some of it is actual, um, the, the, the CBD and THC data. Uh, and then the growers, the cultivators, and the dispensaries have a portal where they can, they can log on and see their results. And you know, and then we've got a portal as well. And it's steep there, ma'am. I went to WebMaps. I'm mean, WeedMaps. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, and I saw that you had some 
one week maps. Sure. No. I, she, she, she was asking about wheat maps and about sharing data there. Um, I, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Yeah. I mean, is that, I, I'm not familiar with, with how they do that, uh, but I will look at that and you know, maybe that's an option. So, sir? So, uh, the gentleman's question was, why are terpenes important? Um, you know, well, the you know terpenes have a um, have a medical effect. You know, in in conjunction with cannabinoids, uh, you know, there's a concept in in cannabis called the entourage effect, where it, it just means that you know terpenes together, cannabinoids together sort of form a um, I was trying not to say synergistic <laughs> they, they, they work together to create the effect that they need to um, you know example is, there's a prescription drug called Marinol which is synthetic THC uh, and it, it's um, not well tolerated um, people don't exhibit drug seeking behavior trying to trying to find it uh, and you know a lot of people don't do well on it because of the side effects you know? Um, you know however you know cannabis is THC it's also a lot of a lot of other cannabinoids a lot of other terpenes you know and, and people love it I think better a lot better than Maradol when given the choice um, so there's something there where everything together provides this synergistic effect whereas THC alone might not, or even CBD alone might not, and a lot of that really isn't well understood, but it's more anecdotal evidence. Sure. All right. Any, any more questions? Nobody? All right. Thanks so much, y'all. This has been fun. Thornton, everybody. Okay, guys, so um, I'm actually going to grant a little grace period off the schedule. Uh